Happy New Year, everyone. A new decade is upon us, and we have a feeling it's going to be another special one in the sporting world. What's more, it's also an Olympic and Paralympic year, and who better to join us for the first episode of 2020 than two athletes who are hoping to represent Team GB in Tokyo this summer. As those who follow us on social media may have seen, shortly before Christmas we were invited to the Mintridge Foundation's Ambassador Training Day, and we're very fortunate to spend an hour with Marilyn Okoro and Laura Sugar and record what we think is one of our best ever episodes. Over the next 60 minutes, we talk to Laura about her successful transitions from hockey to athletics and then athletics to canoeing, how a chance viewing of London 2012 on TV made her realise that she could actually compete in para sports, wedding dresses and much more. We also talk to Marilyn about receiving her Olympic bronze medal 10 years after winning it, her aspirations to compete in Tokyo and using the power of no to prove the doubters wrong throughout her career. We also talk to them both about the brilliant work they're continuing to do with Mintridge and their hopes for the charity over the next 12 months. So make sure you don't go anywhere. So welcome back listeners and we are very, very privileged today to be joined by not one but two guests in Marilyn Okoro and Laura Sugar. So first of all, thank you both very much for coming on the show. Thank Absolute you. pleasure. Excited to be here and uh, sharing it with a lovely lady here. <laughs> Can't wait, did I? <laughs> so we're here as part of the Mintridge Ambassador Training Days. I guess sort of, first of all, if you could explain, you know, how much you've enjoyed the last couple of days and, and how much it means to you to be a part of this fantastic charity. I'll let you go first. Sugar. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think actually for both of us, we were kind of we've kind of been with Mintridge since pretty much well, you've the very beginning, and I'm yeah. pretty much at the beginning. So we've known Atlas for a long time, and um, for me, um, I'm still very much loving working with young people and getting young people in sport. I think that's the huge passion of getting. That's the future of kind of not just the future of sporting elite, but of of just young people in general and their mindset, and if they can grow up with with values that sport and physical activity and healthy lifestyle can give you, then hopefully the world will be a better place. Uh, so it's getting that message out there. And I think Minchich is great for that, for getting guys like us out there that, yes, our stories of getting to elite sport are great for those individuals that want to get there themselves, but also hopefully they can take things away from us and our general approach to day-to-day -day life of what they can put into their own hobby, regardless of whether it's sport or not. Yeah, I love a quote, so I'm going to have to have a quote oh, here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's Nelson Mandela who said, you know, sport has the power to change the world. And, you know, now Team Mindred, that's basically our goal. Um, and I think times like this where we all get to c get together as one big family, because that's what we are ultimately, it's really not just about harnessing the power of sporting role models, but just being good humans. And the fact that, you know, Alex and the team have put together um, something that not only, you know, yes, we're out there mentoring young minds, but they're also thinking about our development and making us better role models. So I've just been blown away, really, because I was the first ambassador. <coughs> Must put that out there. Can you um, beat me to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you, you know, made the your best friends, Alex. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but just seeing it from the beginning and also just seeing it before it was anything and for it to come into fruition and then to just totally blossom the way it's blossoming. It's just, it's really, really inspiring um, in terms of my personal growth as well. But also it's it's quite selfish because we get so much back from our mentored, day, mentored days with the kids. Um, so yeah, I'm really, really proud to just be part of something so, so special. And you said there that you were the first Mintridge ambassador. How did you sort of get involved and how did sort of Alex approach you with the idea in the first place? So I met Alex um, during the Commonwealth Games, which was probably one of my worst championships to date, but the best because I met Alex. So, you know, sometimes, you know, seeming failure, actually, something's going to come out of it. Um, and literally she was volunteering in the friends and family um, section. So I was there a lot because, you know, I exited a little too early. Um, and she was just a lovely, friendly face, had, you know, struck up conversation. Anyone who f offers me Percy Pigs, we're going to get along. <laughs> uh, I think it was sponsored by Marks and Spencers. Um, and so... Nothing much came of it then, and I got an email through saying, would you like to be an ambassador for another company she was working for at the time? And I was like, oh, yeah, I want to meet this girl again. I didn't even really do any research on the company, but it was about inspiring kids, going on camp, so I was all about it. 
at that point I was based in the States. Um, so Alex was really instrumental at sort of keeping me involved with what was going on in the UK as well. Um, I worked for Jutes for a bit and as I got to know Alex, I just thought she was such an ambassador for sport and f especially females in sport. So we really sort of connected over that. And she just told me about the idea of Mintridge and I was just, I'm very all in. I was like, just go for it, just do it. <laughs> you know, sorry. Um, but I was really, really passionate. I just told her, look, I'm 100% behind you. So, you know, this is the, the dream and let's just keep watering it and, and let's see what happens and, and here we are what's it, four and a half years later <laughs> three and a half years later so yeah I think you helped a lot as well in the in the early days of pushing in the ideas your positivity of being like yeah come on Alex and yeah and both of you bouncing off each other yeah I and I think Alex also was trying to keep me motivated and keep me going because as she shared with me I was sharing with her and I was in a very sort of difficult place with my athletics as well like you know she's always like look just you know get to the next goal and then you can work for Mintridge full time so I think that was a little carrot <laughs> she dangled <laughs> and I'm still going, still going. Um, but yeah Mintridge literally has kept me in the sport as well so it, it does mean so much to me but also just seeing someone accomplish their dream as well it makes you want to go out there and keep fulfilling yours. What's it like then these days when it's not just about the, the mintridge in terms of the interaction with the children and everything, but these days where you actually come together with different athletes from different backgrounds and you can share each other's stories. Steve Eskenazi, we were talking to him earlier about how he's learned so much just from this morning session. I guess how, how much do you value that as well, coming here and having these different talks and listening to other athletes and sort of learning from them? I think, I think it's great and it's, in, it's invaluable for us because we are in kind of very all very different sports and it's a great opportunity to literally even just to hear people's stories of how they got into sport and it gives you kind of a bit of perspective sometimes and also um knowing that it's not so different everyone else across the different sports that everyone's probably shared similar experiences to you um they're all a great bunch of people we have a lot of fun as well it's not just all serious but um we have a load of fun getting to know each other and it's really nice to bounce with each other for different ideas because um, I think especially for us too, we've been in the been with Minches for quite a while that sometimes it could be easy to say the same thing every time at presentations or um, kind of lead similar sessions where then you get ideas from other people and then you think, oh, actually I could I could bring that into my next either mentoring session or school visit. Um, it's really nice just to get inspired for different ideas and maybe thinking, oh, actually the way that they did something was would work better and just trying out different ways. I think I love the fact that, you know, we, um, Alex was telling us earlier, you know, not just anyone is an, as a Mintridge ambassador. So I love that, um, you know, we're all here and been handpicked for a reason. And it's mainly due or more so due to our values. Obviously, we've all got sporting prowess, but, you know, you need to fit the, the Mintridge values and morals. Um, so therefore, when we do come together, it is like, it's just so easy. Um, I'm very, very motivated and inspired by listening to everyone's journeys. Um, we're all at different stages. So it's quite nice to, one, be reminded sometimes at the beginning. Like I met Iona for the first time and she, you know, she's in track and field. I'm just like, oh, you're all, you know, fresh faced yeah, and fresh -faced. beady eyed. <laughs> um, and I want to keep nurturing her as well. And, and, you know, for her, she's looking at me thinking, gosh, you've been to all these games and I'm just trying to get to one. And, you know, so it's important that, you know, we do hear other people's stories and other journeys and not only do you resonate with certain things but you can also sort of help each other um things like the presentation skills very very daunting thing um but you know people have just gone up there and been comfortable enough to share and been quite open but also after today hopefully they feel that they can if they're struggling in any area they can just pick up the phone and be like hey maz you know did you go to this school last year because quite a lot of the schools we yeah. repeat with different ambassadors um so connections like the last two days we've had hopefully just bring us close together so we can all make each other better for the same goal really. And how does it make you feel when you go into a school or you speaking to your mentees over Skype or and you can you can see them re reacting you can see them responding you can see their eyes sort of lighting up how does that make you feel as a, as a person really? I think it's, it's no doubt it's, re it's really rewarding and it's especially for us that are still in still trying to reach even more goals and still training every day you can get quite caught up in that and then mm -hmm. you go and do a, a school visit and it kind of reminds you why you kind of started sport in the first place and you actually get to revisit all those areas that you haven't maybe talked about for a while and then you see the reaction from and it, kids are very honest <laughs> you get, very honest you also get some weird and wonderful questions <laughs> as well as the, as well as the good ones but yeah. it's like oh yeah I have done really well and it's actually really rewarding for us I think people forget that yes we're representing Mintridge and we and we love um 
and we're doing that good thing for the school and and helping those young people but actually it's really rewarding for us and we benefit a lot from Mintridge as well mm. um we're not just working for Mintridge we're it's a two-way two-way street and we get especially days like today where we get we get kind of CPD training with it um we gain a lot and we go in schools and we gain a lot back from from the kids it's amazing how how small things they could point out and suddenly like, oh that's quite it's quite what, what are the sort sentence. of things they will ask then or point out <laughs> <laughs> kids <laughs> um i think you know there's been days i can't lie you know you have your bad spells and you have your bad days but those have been the days where i've you know i've had a school visit and i've gone in and almost the first kid i see has said something that's just completely changed or made it worthwhile that's why i got out of bed today and i think that's a really really powerful mm-hmm. feeling um and also I just love championing people. And so when you go in there and they're just like, oh my God, I love it. I go in and it's Marilyn Day. I'm like, yes, that should be a national holiday. Um, (laughs) But these kids are so excited. So whatever I'm carrying for that day, I'm like, you know, they deserve the best me. So it almost keeps me accountable and just just completely has the power to just transform my mindset. And then I remember why I started. It takes you back to the good old days and sports days. And you're like, oh, track is is amazing. and, you know, my life is definitely going to be measured in more than just my medals. I love, I'm proud of everything I've achieved. Um, but I think I lost a bit of gratitude along the way. So going into these school visits has made me really reflect on what it's taken to achieve those things. And those are the stepping stones to anything you're trying to achieve in life. And those are the key messages I want to leave with the kids. And just seeing a kid that, you know, they're quite, like you said, kids are honest. And they'll say, I don't really like PE, miss, but I've bought my PE kit because you're here today. So I'm like, that is an amazing start. And by the end of it, they're like, I'm going to join my local running club. So just to have that transformation in a 40 minute session and an assembly, I think it's incredible. Yeah. It's also really refreshing, as you say, when like <laughs> quite often they're not like almost simple linear way of thinking where we get so caught up of all the technicalities and all these, yeah. you know, things, selection, pressure to win medals. Yeah. And then you kind of say that you're feeling under pressure for doing this and they just go, well, why? It's yeah. just running yeah. or it's just paddling. Like, yeah. and, and then you go, oh yeah, it is. They like, keep it real. It's actually, it's, it's a more honest and easy way. Like, mm. oh, actually, maybe it's just going to speak to a 10 year old about yeah. what, about um, my kind of feeling under pressure for, for a sport. And you do get some weird questions, especially from, if you're they're in assembly, the younger ones at the yeah. front, just put their hand up and their question is, I like running <laughs> or, Who's your mum and dad? Yeah. Um, I've had that quite a few times. Oh, um, do you know Usain Bolt? I, yeah, do you know Usain Bolt? That's quite a common one. Miss, um, how old are you is the classic one. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> proudly, 35. Oh, you don't look that old. <laughs> My mum's older than you. That's and then the it's like, one. okay, wrapping up question time. <laughs> um, but then you get the kids that are like, Miss, you're so beautiful. And you're like, you can stay. <laughs> Stop it. I like you. <laughs> um, but yeah, just you just you I just love that innocence and when you've got that kind of mindset and you can engage with kids like that, you can get them to do pretty much anything. Like, you know, it's not about being the best, but it's actually about trying. And then you'll realize, actually, I can do this. Yeah. And then hopefully they want to try it again. <laughs> Going to move on now to focus a little bit more on yourselves as, as athletes. And it's the end of 2019, quite a productive 2019. And Tokyo 2020 is only a few months away. How are you both sort of feeling reflecting upon this year and, and looking forward to the next few months what a question so for me personally I'm in it's it's I'm gonna say it's an exciting time um, 2019 has been a year of complete transition and breakdown and let's just start afresh um, and taking all the good bits from the last what 15 16 years and drawing upon all my experiences um, I'm constantly in flux I'm just the athlete that moves from place to place wherever I need to be for my track that's where I'll be so currently I find myself in Wigan training with Trevor Painter who is the husband of my good longtime rival Miss Denny Meadows um, and again it was a through a Mintridge day that I met Jenny randomly <laughs> and you know you know on the surface I looked great but inside I was just like so lost and I just hated sport but I was there inspiring kids and that kept me going and Jenny was just like what are you doing next and I was just like oh I'm gonna get a proper job <laughs> and um, she literally invited me out for a week and I'm still there <laughs> <laughs> I eventually moved out of theirs I stayed for about a month I, was like, this is, I could get used to this um, but you know what I found is an amazing training group 
an amazing coach who really um, has compassion for his athletes and, you know, it's actually given me a lot of ownership over my training because of what I've learned <laughs> is that I do know me better than anyone else. Um, so I'm just trying to sort of avoid a lot of the pitfalls that I've had in the past and trust my knowledge, trust um, my experiences over the years and get back out there because it's been a lot of start stop. I've been to America, I've been back to Essex and, you know, the goal has always been to get back after 2012 and I think that's, I guess I'm bouncing back from that. <laughs> um, and, you know, life doesn't always go in the trajectory you think, um, but I'm healthy. So that was always, you know, it's about the small victories and when you when I goal set, they're really, really detailed. So um, where I am right now, I had to, to remind myself, like, this is what I wanted, where I wanted to be healthy, no injuries, because the last five, six Decembers, there's been a niggle and when you're younger you can kind of push through those but as I've found the older I've got you know the body wins so I'm training a lot smarter um enjoying it because that's what this next season is um and definitely still on that road to Tokyo so still eight months away so we're not going to jinx ourselves <laughs> but I'm in a happy place and I think happy athletes perform well <laughs> yeah. how about you <laughs> my 2019 um has gone different as planned but it um it's gone very well i this time last year i i well i'm still doing athletics main, but i was kind of mainly athletics could kind of just finished we'd been europeans and, and planning for my next year and then i'd have been asked to try out para canoe and um, been asked for a kind of a year or so because i kind of fitted the right disability and also they knew i was strong in certain areas that would form well and i kind of this time last year i think my i was about over 60 seconds to do a 200 meter in a boat and it was kind of oh this is a bit of fun doing alongside my athletics and then between kind of Christmas and April I got a lot quicker a lot sooner so I kind of went from I think 62 seconds to like 49 seconds and so yeah my my year of being mainly doing athletics and with a little bit of a canoe um mixed in ended up being slightly more para canoe and um still athletics but a little bit less um because ended up going to world championships and exceeding my expectations in in that sport which was amazing um and so it's just at the moment it's combining both both sports leading towards next year um i am moved funding to the para canoe so the weighting has slightly gone more to that and um, but it's all it's all the same as Marilyn is trust is kind of the little baby steps every way is because we can get kind of caught up and we've got to get I was like oh yeah Tokyo you're going to Tokyo and it's like well you've got to get selected first you can't just decide <laughs> you're suddenly going it's not, it's not just like that it'd be great if it was just gonna sign just up online I don't know about you <laughs> um, so I'm still learning in that in the new sport of um, power canoe still trying to same as, as Marilyn keep fit in athletics um, and seeing seeing where the new year takes me is the is the it's the minging part of winter isn't it where all the sessions are really long or it's just so much volume and you're literally like we were discussing that overtired is a real thing your parents tell you it's not you know that it is and you were thinking it's not when it's young yeah. and it's a real thing yeah um so it's getting through those small wins and and hopefully getting fitter and faster each day but um yes yeah, so it's been a good year but it's all next year's a big year and it's trying to not think so much about the end goal and thinking about those little little wins in between and that, and that process and hopefully that'll ultimately get us both there and touching just upon something you said there you said that you sort of were told that you had the the right sort of build and frame and and, and skills for canoeing but what made you want to go over there did did they did they approach you first and say we think you could excel at this sport or did you sort of express an interest in them yeah well I so when I started Paris I, I went I kind of fed into athletics. I came from hockey um and I didn't know my foot was um eligible for Paralympic sport at all because you kind of in my athletics category you see the blade runners you don't see people with anchor fusion like me um so I kind of went straight into athletics I knew I was fast and I knew I was powerful and kind of it all really spiraled from there to Rio um I didn't really look at many other sports I've always loved every sport so it's not like I'm just one sport and I hate all the others I'm really this is why being in days like this when I get to meet loads of other sports people is great because it fascinates me so I always when I went away on holiday and things I went kayaking I've tried kayaking and um but I, again you see the para canoe category you never I had no idea that my category that my foot made me eligible because you see oh it's just arms so surely it's just the people in wheelchairs that are doing it but actually it's a lot I've learned now it's a lot about leg drive so um I would have I I never would have even tried it just because I thought I wasn't eligible and also I've always had really powerful legs and really strong legs and I was like oh 
I don't have strong arms. Turns out if you have strong legs, you probably have strong arms too. You just hadn't <laughs> trained them for years. Um, so I, I knew I'd love it. And what, so they, it was a blessing in disguise that they kind of approached me. And um, not saying I didn't, I, I still love athletics. I still have goals in athletics, but I do have those challenges every year. So I get faster, but because I compete against blades, like five people got a new leg last year and suddenly, not saying that they, they've still got stronger, they still got better, but also the technology is getting better. And I'm still, I'm still back myself to be in the chant, hunt for medals. But actually, there's another sport that I love and it would be a more level playing field and I wouldn't have that whole doubt in my mind of, oh, hang on a second, I lie. Like, sometimes I do, especially against the double leg amputees, I'm like, am I ever going to be able to beat them? Because I, I don't have the kind of capabilities that they do. So it was, it was that opportunity. To, I literally went to try it out because I thought, I, I knew I'd love it. And you have to, if you're going to put yourself through training day in, day out, you've got to love a sport. And oh, I yeah. love every sport, but I, I knew been doing it on holiday and things I'd, I'd go out kayaking yeah. for a bit of leisure time so um, not saying I was any good at all the technique wise um but yeah I, I then loved it even more than I thought I would when I first got there the environment they create is is fantastic and um and it's very similar to athletics so it's sprint kayak so it's a 200 meter straight line and you're in lanes so the actual concept of the racing is really similar and that's what I love and I love racing I don't kind of want to just go out and do a time trial and then wait to see what everyone else done I like being in that race and in that environment so it was almost ex ex exactly the same you just sat on your bum instead of running around um so yeah so that's it, it was a blessing in disguise that they they came to me because otherwise I I, I'm, I wouldn't have known that that I could have been even eligible for it so I wouldn't have then kind of approached them to go to it and not being not thinking you're eligible is is a little bit of a theme in your career as well because am I right <laughs> in thinking that you only got into athletics in the first place because you saw someone else with a similar condition and, and thought well if they're doing it I want to do it too sort of thing yeah yeah as I say I've always loved sport and hockey was my main sport um my father's Welsh and I played for Wales um kind of up to the age of of 21 and I thought this is this is me this is my career that was the one I kind of tried at school and was really good at um but you could, unless you're kind of in the full GB setup, you can't make a living out of hockey. You still have to pay to play. So I kind of became a PE teacher. And I, I, my dream was to be a full-time sports person and um, be involved in sport. Um, so when I literally watched London 2012, I was, I was working at a kids' camp, actually. <laughs> I think I was sat making, like, clay models. I think they were actually, they were, like, alien athletes. It was space theme week, but it was the Olympics and Paralympics. So yeah. tied together. Um, and I literally, as I say, you, you see, in the Paralympics, you see wheelchairs you see blades you occasionally see some guide runner like blind athletes with guide runners there's a lot more there's so much more to it and there's loads more disabilities um that are the slightly more hidden disabilities and i i know my foot had had no movement i've just kind of got on with it and that's probably really helped me and also the fact that my parents didn't tell me it should hold me back was yeah. was great and that's what we're in the position i'm now but actually then i never knew about the paralympics and i literally i saw someone actually not even in a running category it was in a um, discus and um so general people see me, they don't see my disability, obviously. But when you point it out, I've got, my ankle doesn't move. And so I have a really skinny calf. I, I have no muscle there and a kind of weird couple of bones sticking out. <laughs> but so to me, it's obvious. And when, especially in the discus, they do a close up on their feet in the circle. And I was like, I've got that foot. Wow. And I literally went, I've got that foot. I could, could I be a Paralympian? And I, and I looked, wow. it's not that simple. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm just going to do the Paralympics. I'm going to win. Um, but I thought, actually, I could, I could try it. And I knew yeah. I was quite fast. I knew in the hockey team, I, was, I, was, I, was, I wasn't the slowest. Um, so that's why I kind of then went and tried it out. And it's the best thing is I was terrified because it was a weird, the, the kind of identity change mm -hmm. from being the hockey player to the disabled athlete when I'd never... I'd had my foot my whole life, yeah. but it was weird that identity change and that going along to being like, oh, and almost feeling a bit of a bit of a fraud that I didn't have as bad a disability as some other people. So that was a, the only thing holding me back of going to that day. I'm so glad I went to that day to try out sports and it was a sport fest in, I think, Guildford and Surrey at the end of 2012 oh. that they, it was literally come and have a go. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so thank, thankfully for London 2012, otherwise I still may never have known. That's quite an interesting point that you raised there about feeling like the fraud, because I guess had you grown up then thinking that your not not that your foot was normal, but that you just were a normal person with just a, just a slightly different foot to everyone else. Yeah, I, like I knew it stopped me doing some things, um, but I kind of and I kind of got my parents, I guess, to thank for it um, that it stopped me doing. Loads of, I always kind of waited though until there's something I couldn't do and then try and overcome it. I never I never saw it as holding me back, and I knew that I couldn't. 
there's certain things I had no I couldn't ever stand on one leg or but it was always because it was my foot it was a lot of physical things and I always kind of found another way to get around it so I just always had the attitude of it was never going to hold me back so I always acknowledged that I had it and I was in my foot and it was always in the hockey team it was always the running joke like about my foot and things like that it was and I always owned it and I loved and it has never really bothered me um but then I guess now I've been in power I'm like oh yeah it's, it, I look back and I realize oh, it has probably did stop me doing quite a few things but physical things like it's but also as I said, my parents were told when the doctors when I was born they were like oh she'll be absolutely fine every day like, as long as she doesn't want to be a sports person and they're like oh she won't be sports you'll be a brother my brother hates sport <laughs> and I got the sporting bug so that was the best thing that they never told me yeah. that and they never and they and they like sport and they took me to it like so mm. I don't think I've just not let it hold me back and I've not ignored it but I'm like well, why should I kind of shuffle around things when I could just give it a go anyway um so it is it is weird because weirdly as I've got into paralympic sport I've realized more things that I can't do um because I've pushed myself more mm -hmm. um but also I've come across varying disabilities and I and from thinking oh actually do I fit to then say coming against the blades and I've actually got a disadvantage against the blades it's given me that whole different perspective of actually you don't really know individual to individual you have to really understand their their disability the disability in day-to-day -day life might be not as bad in the sporting environment it's how it affects you in that in that function is that something that drives you as well what the, the doctor said initially the fact that he said oh you'll be fine as long as you can't be sporty is that something that drives you proving that actually I can do what I want there's nothing holding me back yeah now it is um I didn't know at the time it was only when I got into Paralympic sport my parents were like oh they did say that you wouldn't be a sports person <laughs> and I was like oh just guys um you know that thing you're really amazing at <laughs> <laughs> just got the sports the sporty bug but I think it is a driver I think there's what those I think all my life I've been quite good I've had quite positive um people pushing me on there was one particular I mean, yes you'll probably remember certain coaches or people telling you you can't oh, do that yeah. but I remember one one specific hockey coach like didn't give me any like feedback as in how I could get better all I wanted to know what areas I can improve she's like I just don't think you're gonna make it because you're not fast enough now I'm like ha. show you <laughs> um and I wouldn't know like that that thing actually really spurred me on to look back the and get the power actually, of no has yeah. basically fueled my entire I guess, career Marilyn, <laughs> you probably like had yeah so many told and that's I guess when we go started into kids, with my mum if people tell you can't do it it makes you even more yeah determined to tell yeah. you can I hate well I used to hate the word no I used to just have this weird reaction <laughs> to it because you know growing up how I grew up there's a lot of no's and you can't do this and you can't do that but my the first no that I was defiant against with my mum because my mum's a Nigerian lady okay <laughs> let's just get that out there um you know I went to this incredible school you know, grew up in Northwest London. So being in that school already, it was like, you, you've got to make the most of this opportunity. Nigerian background, you're going to be a lawyer or doctor, right? So I go home and I'm like, mommy, I won sports day. And so I didn't send you to school to run, read your book. <laughs> I was like, but mommy, I'm the fastest. I don't care. <laughs> Can I go training? Can you go? Like before I could even say anything else, I was up, you know, carrying on doing my homework. So that was the only no that my mum has ever said that I was like, do you know what? There's, there's more to this. Like I can be a great athlete and I can be a great student. But, you know, George really believes in me. And that was my very first coach. And I think he just saw that, you know, yes, I had the talent, but I didn't have the support network at home, didn't have the finances. So he was just that person that he said sh her mind needs to be really strong and I need to fill her with confidence, which he did. And I went to a fantastic school in Hertfordshire um, and they really developed Marilyn, the individual, as well as being the athlete, as well as being the student. So, yeah, we got around my mom. I mean, I had to make it to the Olympics for her to be OK, but, you know, <laughs> details, <laughs> details. Um, and so every no, I've just tried to turn into a yes. And every negative situation, we've just tried to find a way around that mountain. And, you know, it's it, there's a balance, though, because you can't, you know, every race can't be fueled as, oh, I'm going to show that person because I'm quite an emotional person, as you can probably tell. Um, so it's, you know, as it's got, as the stakes have got high, I've had to, you know, really remind myself of why I'm doing stuff. But definitely the power of no has been something I, I live by. Yeah. Also <laughs> yeah. the power of yes. Yeah. That's what got me in the situation to start off with. That I went, <laughs> I went, yeah, I'm gonna go try it. Yeah. And I think that's yes. said is a lot. Most sports people, uh, are probably yes people. Just like turn sometimes those you knows into yeses. Yeah. Sometimes <laughs> you say yes to things and then you go, why did I do you that? You mean not yet? Right? Yeah. <laughs> you mean not yet? <laughs> like, oh, you want to do a presentation in front of two thousand people? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, turn, then you're like, why did I say yes to it? But something always good yeah. or learning comes out of it and 100%. I think you find out with a lot of sports yeah. people is, is they've either been told no and yeah. said yes or they yeah. just say yes to things 
And I think, you know, the, the F word, well, there's two of them, fear and failure. Um, they need to be your best friends because the other side of that fear is the thing you want most and failure is your greatest teacher. So it's like I've really learned to turn that around because growing up how I grew up, it was like I wasn't allowed to do anything wrong and, you know, high achievers generally perfectionists. But actually just learning that it's striving for excellence, which is just being the best you that you can be, making sure you leave no stone left unturned. Um, and, yeah, just learn, like, if you th those perceived failures often direct you and put you in the direction that you're supposed to be on. So, yeah. <laughs>bits of my career because I think you're just so in the moment like you just you know everything's four year cycle or two year cycle for world champs or Europeans and qualifying times and I didn't really ever um, celebrate each milestone I was getting to and I was doing some incredible things until I couldn't do it anymore so you know running 159 just for fun <laughs> like just totally you know oh, running 50.5 <laughs> whereas now that I you know it's it's a little bit more challenging <laughs> um, and the things I used to do in training I just literally took it as given because I just had to do it you know um so things like I look back on running 159 on my own at Lee Valley the windiest track in the universe actually the UK is just windy tracks everywhere <laughs> But I was so desperate to make that world chance team that the night before, even though I'd run 159, I think I was like 100th off um, at Crystal Palace in front of thousands of people. I needed to go and prove and run it again, run the standard at Lee Valley with no one there at my local league in the B race. <laughs> so things like that, just being able to bounce back and be laser focused on my goal and go after it. Um, I'm really proud of those things. Obviously making teams... Um, you know, pulling on that vest because it's, it's something that I'm so desperate to do again one last time in my career. Um, so I do really, you know, I don't take those for granted anymore. But just the fact that when I do decide that I've had enough, <laughs> which happens about once a month. Um, <laughs> no, but when I, you know, when I do get, because everyone just says you just know when you know, when, when I can't be bothered to, to go down the track and put myself through 2200s, I will, I'm sure I'll know. Um, just being able to look back and say, you know, I've had a really long career and I've met some incredible people um, and, I'm, and I'm giving back in some way. I think it's, it, I used, everyone used to ask me, are you going to coach? And I'd be like, hell no. <laughs> Coaches are crazy. <laughs> um, so no, I don't want to be a coach. I am a lot more focused on sort of the athlete well-being and mindset and mentoring. Um, but it would be criminal if I didn't give back in some way because I... I am a unique athlete for the UK. We don't have many 4A athletes um, or a lot of them are not allowed to blossom as they need to. And I think in many aspects of my career, like I've tried, they've tried to stifle me, but I've just stayed true to who I am and stayed true to my running style and, and my shape and who I am. So definitely I need to um, give back in some way and inspire the next me, <laughs> male or female, to, um, to just be them. Yeah. I think when you said about like um, looking back and enjoying it, when you asked about like what's the key moments, that it's like you could look back and say, oh, well, this medal or that medal or this mm. medal. Like, I mean, my first, my the relay medal I got meant a lot because coming from a team sport to an individual, that was almost one of the ones yeah. I most enjoyed. Um, but actually, Rio final, the 100 meter, I was really nervous. Yeah. And it's, you, you kind of. You put so much pressure, you, you do it because you enjoy it. And then you yeah. turn up, you get in the core and before you race, you're like, why am I doing this? You That's literally hate yourself I, before well, every race and thing, you're like, why? And yeah. then you get out there, you race and you love it. Yeah. And it's, it again. It's like, it's like, <laughs> it's, you have to sit in a room and wait to yeah. race. That's the worst bit. And I remember all my races, my, for me, I went in rank like eighth and tenth in Rio in the world in both my events. So for me, it was to get to the final. Mm -hmm. And I had to run a personal best to get there. And I did it in the 200, broke the British record, went to the final, came, set, yeah. came fifth. Um, was amazing and a new person was and then the 100 meter 
semi-final went and that was the one where I was like kind of literally just made it through fun that was when I was ranked 10th in um and it kind of went like a bit of a blur I'd had like a bit of illness in the whole in the whole camp and really stressing of need to fly home and things and um that 100 meter final it was the last race of the whole Paralympic Games on the track it was like nine o'clock at night full stadium and I remember stood on the start line normally I, I like nerves I always run better when I've got nerves I think quite a few people do um so I still had the nerves but I just stood there and I went I did it I said to myself and I just smiled and yeah. like, like I look back on it and I'm like it was the 100 meter final it was like massive race like full yeah. crowd it was like you know the the the, the blade race for yeah. for the women and I just went, I've done it. Mm-hmm. And that moment, I really remember, I don't remember any of those because it's all blurry because you put so much pressure on yourself and yeah. you, like, you enjoy it at the time, but you, you kind of have to almost watch it back on video mm-hmm. to, to feel real. But I really can literally, whenever you, I need to, I can stand on that start line again and go, I did it like from, so from watching 2012 and wanting to be a Fordham athlete, wanting to be at the Olympics or Paralympics and whatever sport that may be. So then go, I've done it. And that was really weird that it hit me on the start line at the 100 meters in <laughs> Rio. Um, and I, and then again, I ran a person best. I came fifth, and I beat like the the reigning the reigning champion from four years ago. But that that feeling of uh, that's the only time I've kind of really appreciated it while about to start a race. And so above all kind of medals and things like that. Yes, I really love all the achievements I've done. But that that sense of I've actually done what I've set out to do, and um, I still put pressure on myself. I still want to do well. It's not that there's yeah. no pressure anymore, but it's actually that bit of appreciation. So that's one of the moments that I'll. I'll always remember because I kind of can because I've not blocked, <laughs> I've blocked it out. But I it, kind of like to nice call feeling. that when I'm talk in my talks the pressure perfect moment. Yeah, because it's just being able to. I think what you did there is you almost you still had the nerves, you still had the, you know your drivers, but you also really appreciate appreciative of where you're at because you in that moment you're just like this was my goal and look at everything I've overcome and I've made it here and yeah. so you're like I'm going to enjoy this, yeah. <laughs> um, and that I think is what every athlete just craves to feel in that moment and being able to de- deliver. <laughs> yeah. What's it like competing at an Olympics or a Paralympics compared to competing at a, a Worlds or a Europeans or a British Championships? How different is it or is it different at all? Um, I think it's different f- for a few reasons. Um, a, you have the whole village invite. You have all other sports there and you're, you're not just on the athletics team or mm. the community team. You are, you're part of that big either Team GB or Paralympics GB and there's so almost you always feel like there's more people behind you like I remember before Rio that it was like a you, just a thing going around online and you could click oh, I'm supporting this person just random people could be like <laughs> I'm supporting you like and it yeah. was that thing that part of it is amazing um, and also I think the fact that it only comes around four years like so like kind of the added kind of incentive that it doesn't come around that often it is it's a special thing to be a part of I don't know what do you you've been to um <laughs> I've been around <laughs> um yes I think obviously the big O is is massive um but if you think about sort of now I revel in oh I'm an Olympic bronze medalist but I, I didn't have my bronze medal for a lot of my year <laughs> a lot of my career so that is it's a new thing I didn't even have to run to be a bronze medalist um, <laughs> um, amazing if someone had told me that um, great and I think given the nature of the 800 um, it didn't matter if it was Europeans Worlds Olympics it was always just cutthroat competition and okay knowing my journey it's been marred with drugs and sport um, again the DSD um, debate conversation um, so I think when it came to the nitty gritty in terms of competition, I tried to personally not be like, oh, this is the Olympics. Oh, it was all, oh my God, it's game time, it's competition. And my threats came from wherever, whether it was domestic, whether it's the States, whether it was Africa. And that was the beauty of the 800. We're all different shapes and sizes. Some of us were coming from the speed background, some of the endurance. Um, you know, you'd randomly get a random Moroccan <laughs> who'd just suddenly run like the world lead. Um, <laughs> so yeah, between the three, I didn't, and also because personally I love to push myself from the inside so I felt like if I said oh it's only a European I might drop my performance level and be like Ugh. so yeah and I just felt like you know no matter whether it was a Grand Prix the, the competition for me was always go- I always had to bring my A game I was always gonna you know be that person that <laughs> goes off like a banshee um, <laughs> and I always just wanted to run fast however the Olympics is really really special um if i ever did differentiate i love the multi-sport element the village style i did i did used to get frustrated when we were just in hotels because you didn't get to see everyone and you know, social butterfly <laughs> and all that um 
and there's so little time to socialize anyway so it's nice that you're in a village and obviously merch like who doesn't love all the stash you get <laughs> duvet <laughs> no the best bit is when the a ath- duvet oh. I've got no no I've got them I know oh, I, th- I know the best bit is yeah. when the athletes bring it into the office and give it out to the staff yeah. then you can pretend you're an athlete that's what uh-huh. it is. I think it's, uh-huh. it's as you say it's the, it, no one can take it away from you yeah uh, like mm. um you you still have all your uh, kind of medals if you win them again, but I guess kind of titles can be they taken as yeah. a new world champion. But if you've got that title of Olympian or Paralympian, you've been to yeah. a games, you've got that for life, and that's really special. And I think the term gets thrown around. I I don't know so much in the, in the Paralympics. There's a lot of uh, everyone uses the term. Oh, you're a Paralympian for people that are para athletes. Um, well, actually, it's kind of it is special to people that've been to Paralympics. Yeah. And I think it's that it's. It's once you've done it, it is a special thing that yes. you, you, no one can ever take it away from you. Um, similar with worlds and, and Europeans, yeah. it's just that that different. As you say, the, that that pinnacle yeah. um, of our sport that you can you can say you've you've been to and you've done yeah. it. Got letters after my name now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and as you mentioned, there you have an Olympic bronze medal. It mm-hmm. did take, unfortunately, yeah, ten years for you to receive it. Which, I guess, how does that? Does that make you feel? Does it, does it bring an element of frustration, or are you just proud to say I've won an Olympic bronze medal? It doesn't matter, sort of the length of time it took to actually receive it. So that was actually my. I've had three medals given back in retrospect, and that was probably the most powerful one, just because I stood on the podium and I had Chrissy, Nicola, and Kelly, and they've all retired. And I thought, Do you know what? I still want to go back <laughs> out there. I've still can compete you know I haven't changed my lifestyle so much where you know it's not realistic anymore and I just thought I got it was the only one that I've been given my medal back and I was really emotional because I was just like I was good enough <laughs> you know it's just it was really that was my selfish moment it's the only time Jeanette Quatcher I remember came to interview me I was like oh, I can't talk right now um just because it just took me back to getting kicked off funding you know you read that letter and they're like you are not a global medalist and I was just like well I actually was so that was technically incorrect but um (laughs) you know you just you know I just had and I was in that crazy it was just before I met Jenny to decide to move to Wigan anyway and I was just in that place where what have I got to show for the last 10 years of service and then it was almost like you know believe in yourself because whether you've got a medal or not I'm still the same me I've still run that you know I needed to just look back on my journey and appreciate what I'd done um so you know just kind of hope that justice will always be done but irrespective of that I can't control that it was great I had a great celebration but with or without without the medal I'm still the same Marilyn so um it was just about kind of rallying around the people that really wanted to support me and um just trusting that my body could do it and it, I needed to lead with my mind because I think my mind was now lagging behind <laughs> um but yeah it's it's great I'm I'm really proud of our sport for cleaning up um those dirty Russians <laughs> um but I like can to we look keep that bit in <laughs> <laughs> I think so we'll slide um, them off and off um and I just think that it's just about, you know, owning your journey and whether I make it to Tokyo or not, I'm okay with that. I'm just going to do whatever I can each day to to be the best me I, that I can be, really. You're listening to Sportspiel, the player's podcast. As a massive fan of athletics myself, um... As I think when the para athletic worlds were in London, I went four times. Alistair, is that right? When the and they were, went once to the world as well. Like, I love watching athletics, yeah. and whenever it's on TV, I'm always looking at the positives and I'm always trying to defend it. But there, there have been so many stories, doping, funding, yeah. all sorts of things mm-hmm. coming out in, in recent times, and it frustrates me because it detracts what other people. It detracts from other people feeling the way I feel about watching athletics. Mm -hmm. How does it make you feel as athletes when all your potential good work, all the amazing things that you do are undermined by other people? It's so sad because it's almost like every amazing performance now, there's that question mark. Oh, but, you know, are they clean? You know, and I think that is really, really sad because 
we know what goes into it day in and day out and unfortunately uh, the few are spoiling it for the many um but at the end of the day we just have to keep being great ambassadors for clean sport um talking about it having the conversation and you know hopefully situations like mine <laughs> can inspire and just let people know that just keep doing the best that you can do because there are people that are on our side um and you know just control the controllables so a lot of people say oh, are you frustrated are you angry i can't really waste any more emotional energy on on something that is beyond my control um so just comply with anti-doping and just be the best ambassador that i can be how about you I was gonna say, when you said earlier about the things that are out of our control like we can do our best to promote clean sport and and help spread the message but ultimately we can't stop someone from another country or Mm -hmm. any athlete that potentially wants to cheat like we can't physically stop them and it's that fine balance for you want to be an advocate for your sport and and promote it but you have to you have to focus on your training and if you and as as a man said if 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 she'd spent so many years like stressing and worrying about like uh kind of who's doping or whatever you you probably wouldn't have had the performances that you would because you'd your, your emotional energy when you're training day in day out you have you can't just kind of waste energy here there and everywhere you have to put everything into it and so it's it, you have to be careful where you where you spread that energy so it's it's promoting our side and I think UK anti-doping is fantastic for that and we have a really good system in our country luckily mm-hmm. um but, so we do need to keep wearing the merits but we need to control our controllables and, and yeah. be satisfied that when we go and do the absolute best we can that is that's that's the best that we've done and um, and hopefully if there are cheats out there they they will get caught um, and you kind of have to have trust in that process yeah. help to push it forwards and make it better um but also have that have that faith um so that you don't get too kind of dragged down into it i just always say they need drugs to run with me so <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> conversely then uh, there's a real plus point that i've noticed in athletics and, and para canoeing at the moment in, in that it's women who are leading the way for britain you've got Jeanette chippington emma wiggs charlotte henshaw yourself in canoeing and you've got you had jess ennis hill christina hurugu yeah. you've had dina asher smith all these great women it's a fantastic time for, for women in, in British sports at the moment. I guess how proud does that make you feel to see so many women not just winning, but also being admired and being talked about for what they're doing? Uh, amazing. I guess it's it's so good, especially for when we work with younger people, is to be able to, the amount of times, that, especially when I talk about para sport and I ask kids who's watched para sport, I ask, have you seen Johnny Peacock? Like, or if I see athletics, I'm like, have you heard of Usain Bolt? Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's been a, like, there's been male figureheads out there. And now I can go into a school and be like, you know, Dean, uh, Dean Rush Smith, mm-hmm. Katrina Johnson Thompson. Yeah. And they know that they are household names with mm-hmm. young kids in general, but also young girls especially, that there are more household names coming out there. And um, that's huge. That's huge for inspiring gen- the next generation. Like there's b- young boys growing up wanting to be footballers. There are so many idols and so many inspirations for them. Um, where there's not as many in the public eye as women. And it was great, like the recent sports personality you had, both Kat and Dina both there. Um, and that was just fantastic to have that on that global scale, have it in the media. That's what it's got to be. There's, there's loads of women doing really well, but it's having it in the media that's accessible and becoming a slightly more well-known, that's going to get the word out there to inspire that next generation. And especially with girls, especially like around teenage girls, that's the kind mm-hmm. of biggest drop rate yeah. of of sport, um, especially from my perspective, like para canoe, I'd love to kind of push it more out there as well because it's not accessible in some cases, but it's also in some places it is accessible. I've trained in Nottingham, so kids can come, can go and try um, sports out there. And some kids don't like the generic sports of hockey, netball, rugby that you get given yeah. at sport. And so actually the range of female ambassadors out there, like the loads of female horse racing yeah. ambassadors out there at the moment that's more than ever seen before and um, all these different sports coming out and that shows girls actually if you don't like one sport there are actually others and there's other activities that you might be good at and so it can only be beneficial to hope get more out there so we're striving to keep pushing it 100 percent. i think that's the power of our roles with Mintridge really because we literally make ourselves accessible to the kids so my driving force is just being the change that I wanted to see or being who I needed when I was you know younger um, and you know honestly the amount of 
young girls that I get coming and boys going oh can I see your muscles miss <laughs> and that used to be something that was difficult I'd be like no, I was trying to like hide it I can't hide it it's me and they're like whoa but you're still pretty and I'm just like wait whoa whoa and you're still feminine I'm like yes and I'm an athlete and I'm kicking you know what so um you know it's just nice because I guess when I was growing up everyone was just this superhero on tv and just seemed so unattainable whereas you know I'm there I'm like who knows Wembley Stadium that's where I grew up (laughs) and you know just relatable things to someone somewhere um but especially I was we've got a new program called Bolly Run which is half Bollywood dancing, which I love, um, and then running. So just getting kids active and sort of almost distracting them and trying something new. And like, let's just, you know, just drop our guards. And then it's amazing how you can get them to run 800 after that because all <laughs> the endorsements are going. Um, but the amount of young ladies that, you know, we, are, we do a bit of mentoring with it as well. And I asked them what stops you taking part in sport. And I was thinking they're going to have the boys and this and that because I just love beating the boys. <laughs> um, but it wasn't that. It was just, you know, all the pressures they face with social media and the expectation to look and feel a certain way. Um, and so I was just shocked because that was never, I was always just, let's just do whatever I can. I want to be the best. Like what we're ha- this revolution we're having now is just always what has been in my head. Like girls can do anything and I can beat the boys. That's like my favorite sports bra. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I was just shocked at the, you know, how much that affected um, young ladies and their self-esteem. So it's really, I take it so seriously, like being able to go in and there's so many of us now um, in different sports, BMXing, like there's something out there for everyone but you just need to try. And hopefully by hearing our stories, something can give them the courage to just think, let me just give it a go. Let I me try. I think <laughs> the, the body image thing is really key, what you said there, like Instagram and, and Facebook, mm. like every, all the social media and girls think, oh, I've got and Like you're like, God, they're edited, come on. <laughs> but like I, I did a talk at my local school and I edited a, a kind of photo versus one that I hadn't edited. And I was yeah. like, look, look how easy it's to do. Yeah. And, and also I got married in the summer and uh, kind of, because <laughs> I got into para canoe. I then suddenly was getting a lot bigger up top. My arms were getting a lot bigger. And kind of a lot of girls, I, I work at my local school and um, kind of like, oh, what wedding dress are you wearing? Oh, you, you know, and the people are like, oh, you're slimming down for your wedding. I was like, well, actually, I'm accidentally bulking up for my wedding because I've gone to a different sport. But that is more important <laughs> to me is to get strong yeah. and get better at Paracanoe than slimming down for my wedding dress. So I ended up having, I went for a slightly different award dress so I could look stunning, it freer in my upper body. <laughs> but it is like, that's yeah. what, especially in girls, that's that kind of, oh, you, you know, yeah. you're going to fit into that dress, actually. Yeah. Um, that sport promotes that positive body image. You don't yeah. have to, you know, you don't have to be massive, loads of loads of muscles, yeah. but actually being strong and being fit and being active is not a bad thing. Yeah. And that, look, you see, you know, you see the girls at Sports Personality, you saw loads of them on the red carpet, all oh, looked absolutely, absolutely amazing. Yeah. And it's like, they're not skinny, they're not restricting yeah. their diet or anything. They are just strong and they're fit and they're active, happy yeah. women. Um, I think that's great to promote. I think being a middle distance runner, you know, there's no, well, in any sport, there's no one size fits all, but I've really noticed it with coming into the 800 because, you know, traditionally I look like a sprinter. <laughs> what event do you do? 100 meters? No, time's up by eight. <laughs> um, so I have Party that a lot. <laughs> I can't get out. <laughs> in the blocks. <laughs> yeah, anyway, we don't get along. Um, so just, you know, and that's what I loved about being in America because they're just a lot more sort of, you know just what you see is what you get like good job everybody <laughs> like just go kill it and you know I'd be putting my discus throw in 100 meters and she would not complain um, <laughs> but um for me it was definitely something that when I came to elite sport it was the first time I'd faced any kind of judgment about how I looked because everything was all great at school and I remember remember someone quite high up you know saying I was too muscly to run 800 and I was like okay but I've run 158 so <laughs> which part you know can't I do and you know, trying to make demands. And it was just like, it's about optimum performance. So if I need to be 62 kilos, that's what I need to be. It, you know, Jenny Meadows is half my size. So obviously she's going to be a lot lighter. Um, but that's, you know, what I need to do. Do I go in the gym and hammer weights? No, because that's not going to help my mileage, which I need to do. So we all come from it from different angles and it's about being your optimum. Um, uh, and obviously when you're young and impressionable, it's, it's, it's not that easy to just understand that. Um, and there's pressure from your peers and things like that. I remember being at boarding school and everyone was trying to be supermodels and I was like, well, I 
like food. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> let's go play some lacrosse kind of thing. Um, but, you know, it's it's everyone's got their own little journey and has to get to that place where they can look in the mirror and be happy with who's looking back at them. So fortunately for me, sport was was the vehicle that helped me do that. I think it might be time to start thinking about rounding up soon. So I'm going to ask one final question. And I guess similar to what we touched upon earlier, 2020 is just around the corner. There's a lot of potentially very exciting things that could happen for you as individuals, as us as a sporting nation and for Team Mintridge as well. So I guess sort mm. of how are you feeling ahead of what could be a very, very exciting year? Do you want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, I guess the reason for both of us is we is we've got goals set out um Tokyo especially being a games year obviously the ultimate goal is to go there and challenge for a medal and challenge for that gold medal um but there's loads of little baby steps along the way and um so keep progressing each day keep giving my best each day and hopefully hopefully pieces will come together um but I guess it's it's also enjoying the journey along the way um so putting all that pressure on on getting that one goal um then if it doesn't happen then you kind of left for nothing it's almost um Actually, somebody told me a quote once before when I was at school and it was saying, like, you've got to be happy without the medal to be happy with it. Like, some people, I've spoken to loads of gold medalists that then um, kind of had mental health issues, depression, kind of like, oh, it wasn't as good as I thought it was. You've got to enjoy the journey and be happy along the way. So enjoying my sport, enjoying it, getting better. And um, hopefully those targets and those goals will come along the way. We've got a few championships, we've got Worlds and, and Paralympics to come along. So... Um, just trying my best and get better in in both sports and and see where that takes me. Uh, also, in Mintridge, just keep keep getting the message out there about Mintridge. Keep uh, when those programs come along going and hopefully inspiring young people and um, getting the message out there and helping helping that next generation, that future of athletes or just generally happy, active people. Yeah what she said <laughs> um, no it you know it is a journey like all those cliches you hear when you're growing up it's like oh my god I'm at that age but they're actually real um and you know hopefully Tokyo is the next stop um so I'm just enjoying that train ride and all the little stops on the way um Mintridge is a big part of that and it actually keeps me really focused and keeps me going and reminds me of you know why I'm doing what I do and why I started um but yeah it's just about enjoying it and you know experience is a really powerful thing so I'm gonna really need to draw off on that because there are some hungry youngsters coming through <laughs> um but you know I you know you got back yourself haven't you and I've done some incredible things in the sport so I'm just looking forward to sort of getting back out there and I've got a lot of people that want to see me back there as well so that helps um but yeah it's just about support you know the support network is massive um and you know federations and things like that you can caught up in all of that but at the end of the day you know who you're doing it for and why you're doing it so you know i believe in you i believe in you too, <laughs> we believe in the too. <laughs> thanks for this out there it's it's so nice to be able to sort of just say what you want to say and, yeah. and and have this platform because there's so many athletes that are going through the same thing and we don't talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, me too. So, yeah, thank well, we you guys. Are, we are here as a players podcast, so thank you so much yeah. for, for coming on, being some of our, if not our best ever interviewees. I'm going to say that right now. Uh-huh, we'll take I've that. I've thoroughly enjoyed the last hour. <laughs> uh, we'll definitely be following your careers very closely and yeah. all the best and maybe who knows one day we can get you back on. Yes, that's it. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. A huge thanks once again to Laura and Marilyn for speaking to us and being such fantastic interviewees. We cannot wait to follow their progress this year, and who knows, maybe one day we can get them back on the show. A massive thank you must also go to Mintridge for continuing to give us unprecedented access to the athletes and we cannot wait to bring you more very soon. In the meantime, make sure you follow us across social media using the handle at SportsBillPod and subscribe to the podcast on all of your usual outlets. Alistair will be back in a fortnight to bring you another fantastic interview, so make sure you tune in then.